I actually very honestly think one of the reasons I got hired here was the work that I did with Greg. So that's the love that I show for this man. Uh, and so yeah, let's welcome him. now because he, he took away my two lines. The two things I was going to say when I got up here was, number one, that I call myself a documentary filmmaker in recovery, which is true, and that being right is not enough. So you, you, know, you, just, you, just, you just took away my two lines. Thanks a lot for uh, But you also said that uh, it's because of me that you got hired here, so I am now going to, uh, uh, I'm now going to charge a 20% cut of <laughs> so just whoever's in charge of the finances here, please take note of that. I spent the first part of my life here until I was 18 years old. And then I moved to Mexico in, in the 90s because of a film that I think you, you all saw. I, I heard that you guys watched Sleep the other a few days ago. Is that, yeah, is that no. true? Yeah, that, that, that uh, David, who you met, is a friend of mine. And Alex Rivera, the director, is a... Uh, is a, is a good friend of mine, too. And in 1998, he asked me to come down and, and work with them on, on the first, very first draft of that script. And the great thing about Mexico at that time was that there were so many social movements going on that were actually winning. And I was used to social movements that lost. I, I was used to, when I, when, I, when I was growing up, I was always getting involved in, in, in movements and, and, and calling things out when they were wrong. But I was so used to things not working that I kind of forgot. I kind of forgot that you could actually win your fights. You could you win your battles. And when I went to Mexico in the '90s, I watched lots of social movements start to win. The Zapatista movement was winning. Uh, citizens' movements to get out the, the the corrupt political party that had been in power for 70 years. They were winning, and so it was a really great time to to make films. The problem was is that most of the films that I made were awful and they were really boring and, and uh, they would sometimes do really well in museums and college campuses but they weren't having any impact on the real world they weren't changing the world um, and they weren't making anybody happy because if people don't enjoy watching what you make then why make it you know, that's why that's why we do what we do um, so I'm going to talk more about that but before I get up here and, 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 and bore everybody at 3 o'clock in the afternoon with, with you know, more, more of the story of how I got to do what I do, uh, I wanted to show a video. And, and before I show that video, I just wanted to mention that uh, a few days ago, I was back near my old neighborhood on 14th Street. And there was a guy who was taking cans out of the garbage can. And this hipster guy with this long beard, um, with brown rice in it, I think, uh, was was taking was taking was taking pictures of the guy taking the cans out of you know the cans out of the, out of the uh, out of the garbage can and, and asking him to actually pose. Right? And finally, the guy who was who was collecting the cans turned around to the, to the photographer and said, "Hey, what are you doing?" And the guy said, "I'm making art." So what do you mean art? I'm like yeah, I'm making art. I'm going to make you into beautiful art, right? And I wanted to turn around and say, "Dude, this is 2015." If you're gonna, why make art about somebody when you can make art with people? And so we think about what we need to do to make that happen. We, we create the stories together, we think about ways to make those stories go viral, and we think about ways that we can use those videos also in small screenings with maybe just a few people and, and work those videos so that people can become better organizers. So this first video is the, the, the latest piece that we made, and it's, uh, it's about the, uh, the movement of Central American migrants in Mexico that, uh, not many people know about this, but a lot of migrants who come through Mexico on their way to the U.S. decide to stay in Mexico. And there's an amazing movement of migrants that, from, from, uh, from Honduras, from El Salvador, from Nicaragua, who decided to stay in Mexico and organize other migrants who are on their way through for lots of different reasons, to teach people about, uh, to teach people about how to uh, take advantage of their rights and stay safe as they travel through Mexico because it's obviously very dangerous. Uh, how to uh, also even even impact the government in Mexico and exercise political power so that policy changes are made that actually makes their lives 
easier and better, and how to stand up to organized crime. And about a year ago, does everyone remember when, when there was this whole media circus around, uh, around undocumented miners that were, unaccompanied miners that were coming through into the United States? And the way the media covered it was awful. And so when we started to brainstorm about what, to, what kind of video we wanted to make, and we are talking about what kinds of concerns people had in the movement, people were saying, well, the media is really awful. The media never gets the story right. Even, even so-called activist media always get the story wrong because they tell the story of migrants as if they were poor, uh, uh, powerless. You know, you, you, know that, you know what I'm talking about, where you see, you see stories about certain people and they take away their power and you show them as, as kind of you know, save the children kind of life, right? Have any of you guys ever seen an activist documentary or an activist piece of media and you just want to go to sleep? It's just, it's, it's boring. And you know that the only people who are going to want to see it are the people that already agree with the point of view of that, of that video, of that film. Have you guys ever seen anything like that? Um, that, that for me, that, that's, that's, that's part of the problem is that, uh, is that you, can't, you can't change the world if you're only talking to a small circle of activists who already think the way you think. And so that's why I was attracted a few years ago. When I, I used to produce documentaries. I used to work for Telesur for, in Venezuela. I used to work for Al Jazeera. And I stopped doing that because I felt like, essentially, I was acting like the journalist that I was kind of, I was parodying and making fun of in this video. I was just making, making product and just exploiting people even when I was making videos about movements that wasn't really having any impact on the world. Uh, I, you know, I always, I always think about this word impact because that's what I, I want to do with these videos. But most of the time, people talk about impact by the number of hits a video has, the number of people who see it, the number of likes. And the problem is that you need to get a lot of people to see your media in order, in order for it to have an impact. But just getting all those views and just getting all those likes doesn't necessarily mean anything because we see so much stuff and we see so much crap that, we, that, that the moment we see it, we just forget about it. So here's an interesting story about another way to think about impact. So I already told you that. We collaborated with this movement and decided to, to make a, a film together. But when we when we premiered the film a few months ago in uh, in Mexico, we were in the state of Oaxaca on this annual event called the uh, the Migrante Via Crucis, the you know the Migrant Way of the Cross, where every year organizers, uh, people who organize migrants, lead a march with hundreds of migrants from the border with with Guatemala all the way up to the border with. United States, and it's to show people that there are lots of people who have to be invisible when they cross, that go through very unsafe routes to get to the north, but they all walk together so that so that they're safe, so that they teach people how to be safe, so that the media comes and they, and they, they can see more about what migrants are doing. And uh, we premiered the film during this march, and the next day, hundreds of, of police, federal police and immigration police surrounded the town and decided they weren't going to let any of the migrants out, that they were going to deport them. And they suddenly had to switch gears and start to train all the migrants in tactics of nonviolent civil disobedience in order to break the police lines. And suddenly, the video took on a new meaning for the, for the people who had been watching it. Before, the migrants who had seen it were thinking, oh, well, this is funny, it's about us. But then it became a film about how migrants that they organized can actually power and they spent three days training and after three days they, they, they left the, they left the, the shelter where they were where they were holed up and they walked through the police lines the police started to beat them the police expected them to fight back but they didn't and so they, the police had to back off and most of those migrants made it to the US right? but, so that was a, that was a way in which you know in, in, a, in a screening of only a hundred people that the video had a huge impact right so so you know, on the one hand we worked hard to make this video go viral, but it had more impact when 100 people saw it, when the right 100 people saw it, than when 50,000 people saw it you know, on, on, on the internet. Right? So uh, the next thing I wanted to show is a piece to some of the work that we do at, at the School of Authentic Journalism. The School of Authentic Journalism is a project that was founded by a friend of mine, another New Yorker named Al Giordano, who also lives in Mexico. And in the school, we we realize that, that the problem is that most most people who make media about movements don't understand what, I don't know about most, but a lot of people who make media about social movements 
don't understand what it takes for a movement to win. And you can't, the way you tell the story of a movement impacts whether or not a movement wins or not. <laughs> Fear is the, together with apathy, the biggest enemy of social movement and the biggest ally of the of the regime. Humor is important to lower fear. Lowering fear is important to increase participation. We go into the street, we put like a big barrel in the middle of the street. And it's Milosevic's picture is on the barrel. There is a text collecting money for Milosevic's retirement. Please insert the coin. And there was a baseball bat next to the barrel. And it said, if because of Milosevic's economic policies, you don't have a coin, bang the barrel. After 15 minutes, there were 100 people around the barrel banging. Bah, bah, bah. And the police shows up. Like, What's going on here? Whose barrel is this? Oh, we don't know. After some time, they take the barrel, put it in the car and take it away. We take the cameras, snap, snap, snap. The police arrested the barrel. This is the dilemma action. They don't touch the barrel. More people are coming and banging. It. If they take it away, they look silly. There is no way out. Regret whatever you do. So this is the dilemma action. It's great. It's funny. You're having a good laugh. And what is more important, you are destroying the loyalty of, in this case, of the police force. The police force doesn't think that you are right. Doesn't necessarily need to like the movement. But what this action creates is that they stop trusting in the wisdom of their leadership. Because the regime that puts them in the situation where they have to arrest barrels, this something is wrong here. So those are two videos that were produced at the school and uh, one of them is about a barricade and the other is about a barrel, right? But what do those two things have in common, right? Anybody, can anybody tell me what the barrel and the barricade have in common in these two videos? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, they both symbolize something. That's right. And when you, when a symbol is something that tells a story in one image, right? It's it's telling something complex, but it's just one image. There's the story, right? That's spot on, exactly. So uh, um, there's one other thing that they have in common, which is a little less obvious. But anybody can anybody guess what they they have in common? Uh, uh, well, the, the thing is, is that both of them have a strategic use, but they're also telling a story. Right? So the barrel tells a story, right? It tells, it's a symbol, it tells a story. People in, in Serbia in 2000 were, uh, they, they didn't have any money, and the state was, was uh, the government was, was ruining their lives. And so the barrel told the story of what they were going through, and beating the barrel told the story of what they felt and how, and how they wanted to express themselves. But by doing so, they also weakened the, the government. As people came up and lined, lined, uh, lined up and beat the barrel, it, it, it made the government look silly. And then they looked even sillier when they arrested the barrel. So, so it was telling a story, but it also had a strategic value at the same time. And the barricade is the same thing. You know, right? the, the interesting thing about those barricades in Cochabamba and Bolivia was that it was made, you know, people always try to to, and it happens here. It happens. It happened here last year during, during all the, the, the marches and protests. It happened here over the past year. People, you always hear stories in the media. Oh, you know, the movement is violent. The protesters are violent. But the barricades were made out of these, you know, the objects of people's daily lives. What people, what old people's crutches, children's toys. So it was obviously showing people, no, this is us. This is us. This is who we are. And, but it also it had a, a real purpose. It, you know, it was a barricade. Put it in the streets. Don't come on this side. This is our territory. Don't come on this side. But it was also expressing who they were. So it was telling a story, but it also had a, a strategic use at the same time. And that's important because, because that's what we try to do with, with, at the School of Authentic Journalism. We, 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 we teach people how to make videos that, that, uh, that tell a story but also have a, a real impact. So when, you're, when we teach people to, to create a story, we, want, we ask people what they want to happen. Right? So what do you want to happen after you make a video? What do you want people to do after you make this? Okay, you're gonna entertain people, you want, you want people to see it. But then, what exactly do you wanna have happen? So uh, 
So with this, with the, the, the first video that I showed, you know, the danger of journalist crossing, what we wanted to have happen is we wanted to shame the media into talking about, about, uh, about migrants in Mexico a different way. And it's kind of worked in a subtle sort of way. I mean, you can see the, the BBC actually did a story about, about the video, which was hilarious because we were kind of making fun of BBC, you know, really stuffy uh, British journalists, and they were the first people to make a st to do a story about the about the about the film. And lots of people, the media reacted to it. They were kind of a little angry about it. Some people felt insulted. Some people wrote me privately saying, you know, oh, I totally know what you, I totally know what you feel, but. Uh, I can't say so in public, but yeah, we really shouldn't make any more stories like that. And then also, we wanted it to have an impact by by showing it from shelter to shelter. That's what we're doing right now. We're, we're organizing a tour where, where the people who are organizing the migrants are going to be using it as an organizing tool from shelter in, in, in all the shelters in Mexico. And uh, so we, we thought about before we made it, what did we want to have happen? Right? And that's really important. The other thing is, is that is that the barrel, the barricade, and that video, Danger Journalist Crossing, they're all stories that, that or they're, all, they're all something, they're all, they're all pieces of expression, pieces of art that tell complicated stories in a really simple metaphor, right? I think that if you want to tell a good story, I think that met metaphor is the essence of good storytelling. Take something really complicated and put it in one image that explains a complex image in a really simple way. So that, 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 that's, an, that's, an important, that's an important part of good storytelling about, about complex issues. Because have you guys ever seen films about, I don't know, let's say like fracking, for example. Everybody knows what fracking is, right? Everybody, that's one of the big hot topics that everyone talks about. Like they just made it illegal in, in, in New York State, right? Fracking, you blast into the ground, under the rock, and you take out oil and gas that you couldn't get to any other way, and you leave more than 500 chemicals behind, gets people's drinking water, it's terrible. But it's really complicated to talk about, and most people when they talk about it, they talk about it in ways that people maybe can't understand, or they bore people when they talk about it. And, uh, and that's something that was going on in Mexico just a couple of years ago, when they were reforming all the energy laws in Mexico, changing the laws of it so that foreign companies could come in and, uh, and, and, and drill for oil and drill for gas. And we realized that this whole, all the changes to the laws were gonna be about fracking, but nobody was talking about fracking. So we looked for a way to make a video that would talk about, uh, talk about fracking and talk about why people should think twice before, before letting people come into the frack in Mexico. And, uh, and we wanted to talk about it in a really simple way, in a way that was funny. So we made this next video, which, which I wanna to show to you, uh, called Frack You Mexico. And so when you watch it, uh, think about the video and think about the things that we do in the video in the same way that you saw the barrel and the barricade in those other two videos. Okay. Las colinas están vivas con el sonido del futuro energético de Mexico. Los científicos dicen que el futuro energético de este mundo ya no es el petróleo y por supuesto no es la luz solar. Es el gas natural y Mexico está en el cuarto lugar en el mundo de reservas de gas. El problema es que ustedes no saben sacarla de la tierra. Nosotros en los Estados Unidos utilizamos la fractura hidráulica o fracking para sacar el gas de la tierra. ¿Ustedes saben qué es eso? Mexicanas y mexicanos, bienvenidos a Frac U, una institución gratuita y libre en donde usted puede enterarse de cómo vamos a sacar su gas de la tierra, llevarla a nuestro país y dejar mucho a cambio. De nada, yo me llamo Joseph T. Hodo, pero en español me llamo Joe T. Hodo. ¿Usted por casualidad sabe qué es la fractura hidráulica? No. ¿O el fracking? No. ¿Usted sabe qué es esto? Un coco. Un coco es duro arriba, pero abajo hay mucho que. Agua. Es lo mismo con esta tierra, México. Tenemos la parte de arriba, pero abajo tenemos mucho gas. Y este gas está atrapado en una capa de rocas que se llama lutita. Tenemos que perforar un hoyo muy profundo como uno o dos kilómetros debajo de la tierra. Perferonos. 
drill, baby, drill. Una vez que nosotros perforamos este hoyo, nosotros queremos romper esas rocas para liberar el gas, ¿verdad? Entonces, nosotros tenemos un cóctel de químicos de fracking que le vamos a meter. Bajo mucha presión, más de 500 químicos hacen su trabajo mágico destruyendo la roca y liberando mucho gas. Mi asistente aquí le va a mostrar cómo nosotros en los Estados Unidos vamos a estar disfrutando de su gas. Pero no se preocupen porque también nosotros le dejamos no solamente el gas, sino todos los químicos que metemos para romper la piedra. Provecho, jóvenes. Quédese con su coco envenenado. Yo no lo permito, yo no quiero, yo no lo permito porque yo amo a México. Yo también amo a México. Yo sí. creo que amo este país más que usted. Sí. Tanto es mi amor por México que yo venir a fraquear con todos. Claro, a fregar a todos. A fraquear. Joder. Sí. No, no, no joder, fraquear. Es lo mismo. No, 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 no. Joder empieza con H y fraquear con no, F. No, es joder. Entonces nos deslindamos de cualquier accidente que podría pasar. El general Emiliano Zapata dijo que la tierra es de quien la trabaja y yo estoy de acuerdo. Es por eso que a mí me da mucho gusto trabajar su tierra. Nuestra tierra. Por su propio bien. Basically, we're trolling. We wanted to basically troll everybody that's trolling you, right? So, you tend to get people angry so you can get a rise out of them. And that's what we wanted to do in the hopes of, of getting the movement started. And there are two things that happened concretely that I'm very happy about after this came out. Well, three things. It did go viral all over the place. It's one of the videos that we've done on the Narco News TV blog that I run and with this rule of authentic journalism that has most been seen. Um, on diff all the different platforms that it's been on. It's been seen millions of times, and uh, after, after, after people started to see it, uh, for the first time, people started writing about fracking, doing reports about fracking, and, and I think that's because, to some extent, because of, because of the video going viral. Also, it got picked up by lots of other media. If there's time later, I'll show you. It's, it's part of what you can do when, when something goes viral. You can kind of take the idea, take, take the concept, take the joke, take the story, and extend it into other media. So for example, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a channel called Millennium TV, which is one of the biggest you know, cable news stations in Mexico. And they invited the character, Joe Tejolo, that, that I play, Joe Tejolo. I mean, in Spanish, it's Joe Tejolo, which is a joke because Joe jo Tejolo, Joe Tejolo means, you know, ice cream rover, right? So that, that, that's a joke. So uh, the character was invited on, on, on this news channel and, uh, and got to talk about fracking more in a very conservative news channel. Uh, and the equivalent of Mad Magazine in Mexico, this magazine called Chamuco, did a, did a story, did a photo novella, like a photo comic with this character. So we went into all different media, and, the, and the, the, that's what a virus does. It extends into other media and keeps going. And And so after that, people did start to talk about fracking. And again, going back to the idea of, of the kind of impact it can get when millions of people see it, but also the kind of impact that happens when 20 people see it. There's a town in Puebla, in the north of Puebla, in the mountains, Puebla State in Mexico called Pazalan. And somebody saw it there, showed it to a, 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 an assembly of people in the town. And people were horrified because they realized that they're on the southern tip of the of the deposits of, of shale gas in the country, and the town rallied, and they got an injunction to prevent fracking from happening. So that's at least one town that is keeping its water clean at, because of what they did, but at least the story was told and people became aware of it by, 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 this, by this video, because of this video. So again, you have to think about impact on different scales. The, big, the kind of impact you can get from getting 
millions of people to see it and for 20 people to see it. And the reason I like working this way is because I get to make a fool of myself in front of lots of people and uh, have fun doing it and also maybe change the world at least a little bit while we do it. Thinking about things that people like to share is a good way to, is a good way to, to get beyond the you know, usual audience. And the other thing I, 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 I just want to say is that some, somebody, somebody asked what it, they didn't want me to say real life, but somebody asked what it felt like to play kind of a, a stupid character, play a redneck. Uh, it, it, does it feel strange to do that? And you know, when when you make a, when you're making a character, you you, you you get into the character, and what you want is you want to hear what other people have to say. So at playing the bad guy so that you can make other people shine is is is, is a fun way to do things. And so I, when I when I get into these characters, one of the things I want to do is is, is make myself look stupid so that other people. Look good, right? So that, I don't mind playing it at all. In fact, I, I like it because I always tell people that I kind of let myself fall down the staircase so that social movies can shine, right? So that I, I think that it's important to, that's an important way to, to try to bring back, bring out the best in other people. People shy away from the camera when, when uh, sometimes, a lot of times people shy away from the camera when you want them to speak as themselves and very seriously, you seem kind of uptight and people can avoid you. But even though I live, I live an hour away from Mexico City in a city called Pernalaca, and the reason I, I like shooting in Mexico City more is that there's people either enter the story because they want to be part of it or they walk away. Like in Fracu, Mexico, people were really mad, but they, they, kind of, they knew that it wasn't serious also. So they kind of walked in and, and, and uh, accepted the fantasy and, and sort of stepped into it. And I've always found people, there's always enough people who are interested to, to come in and join, this, join your kind of half imaginary, half real world. And that's one of the reasons why I, I, like, I like shooting that way. So you can kind of invite people in if they want to and just leave them alone if they don't want to participate. Right? And the key word is, is is listening to people and, and what people want and what people have to say and what people want to see happen, and then uh, and then creating a story together. Uh, that, that, that's a good way to do it, is, is listen first and then try things out. And recognizing other people's talents and making them shine is extremely important, and if you want to be a producer of your own media, that's super important. Trying to figure out what everybody in your crew can do super well, and then getting them to do it and letting them shine. And so find a person who could just get anybody to tell them anything and make them your new best friend.